Hi, listeners, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Communication Matters. This is the second in a three-part special series of virtual public programs presented by NCA. Now, NCA typically holds public programs twice each year, and these public programs serve to disseminate relevant information about communication to various public audiences. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, NCA's fall public programs are being reimagined as a special series of the Communication Matters podcast series, as well as video recordings of the conversations that we're having. The public program series entitled Communicating During a Presidential Election Year will include and does include three public programs, the politics of health and healthcare, communicating about health in a presidential election year, Today's recording about communicating about the role of race and social change in politics. And finally, Veeps 2020, Kamala Harris versus Mike Pence. So be sure to check out NCA's YouTube channel for a video recording of today's and the two other conversations in this special public program series. Before we begin, let's um, get a sense of who's joining us today on our public series, um, our public program series about race and social change in politics. Joining us today is... Glenn Bracey, Assistant Professor of Sociology at Villanova University. David Cisneros, Associate Professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Illinois. Lisa Flores, Associate Professor in the Department of Communication and Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Colorado Boulder. Isaac Hale, Lecturer of Political Science at the University of California, Davis. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. For those of you listening and viewing this pro program, you can view all of the panelists' full biographical statements and uh, learn way more about their work and uh, the great work that they've done at our website at ncanatcom.org slash public programs, all one word. That's natcom.org slash public programs. So let's get started. This is, uh, we're recording this, by the way, on a particularly eventful day in the 2020 presidential campaign. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we're recording this on the day that it was revealed that President Trump has in fact contracted the coronavirus. And so the news is all a buzz. But I, I'm hopeful that this ongoing cycle of news that we find in this campaign doesn't minimize the powerful importance of race and social protest and social change in the presidential campaign. And Glenn, you, I know, uh, are in a great position to talk a bit about how you think the, the 2020 election might affect uh, current social movement activities, these movements around the country that we're seeing for social change and for social justice. Do you expect them to demobilize, to intensify? Uh, how are they going to play themselves out over the next 32 days? Yeah, I think that the election itself is going to be impactful on movements. I think that's pretty clear for everyone, depending on who wins, movements will go in one of two directions. But uh, the most important thing I think to remember is that it's events, not the election itself, that will drive protests. So to the extent that police continue to uh, murder black citizens, um, to the extent that uh, vigilantes like we saw in, in Georgia around uh, Ahmed Arbery uh, continued their activities to the extent that groups like the Proud Boys, which we saw in the debate Tuesday night, uh, continue to be uh, energized or, or uh, excited by our political leadership, then events are going to continue to happen that need and justify the protest that we've seen. So I anticipate continuity of the protest uh, even through the election, even as we struggle through uh, COVID, uh, a co a COVID winter, I guess, number two. Um, but in terms of the election itself, if President Trump wins, then I think that you'll see uh, a summer next summer like the one that we saw this summer, because President Trump is not only an attractive target for social movements around race uh, because of his own rhetoric and his uh, political policies, but also because he does actions that dramatize movements. So in sending people to, sending um, military forces or uh, militarized police to protest movement areas, he creates the kinds of drama that only fuel uh, protests and, and have since the civil rights movement. 
uh, at least. If President Biden, well, excuse me, if Vice President Biden is made president, so if we're talking about a President Biden, then I think you'll see protests move more away from targeting the office of the president and more toward uh, targeting actual policies that they want to see implemented. Things like federal oversight of police uh, in practice and a renewal of some of the things that we saw under the Biden, um, um, under the Obama Biden administration. So, do you think those movements will, like, I don't know, start paying more attention to Capitol Hill? Um, you know, trying to to mobilize, um, you know, actual legislative movement rather than this sort of, you know, on the street kind of movement. Yes, I think that they will target specific uh, leg legislation and particular federal activities if Joe Biden is elected president. If he's not elected president, then we'll see a continuity uh, that we saw this past summer. Mm -hmm. well, it's interesting that this past summer's uh, protests seem largely focused on issues of race and particularly blackness, black studies, uh, black activism and the like. And I'm curious if any of you, um, you know, Isaac, David, Lisa, anyone has a sense that maybe this is stalling or foreclosing other related justice, social justice issues, uh, queer and gender rights, um, uh, migrant and refugee rights, disability justice, questions along those lines. And in a related note, to what extent does the uh, nomination of Amy Coney Barrett maybe bring some of those more to the fore, uh, women's rights, for example, in ways that, um, you know, uh, they weren't before or they were being crowded out before by, by the focus on race? Go ahead, Isaac. Yeah, so I want to defer to my uh, co-panelists on this question, who I think have more expertise on this, this subject, but I, I wanted to briefly jump in on the previous question, if that's all right. Sure, um, go ahead. I think that Glenn made a, a really fantastic set of points there, uh, but I, I also wanted to draw a little bit of a historical parallel. I think back to 2008, when we saw the kind of historic election of President Barack Obama, we saw that there was a lot of liberal... Uh, frustration with Wall Street during the height of the financial crisis. And a lot of, I think a lot of liberals were galvanized at the time. We saw some of that energy diffuse after the election of President Obama. And it's possible that that is a similar phenomenon could manifest in 2020 with a lot of people who are not directly affected by the police killings, people who may be allies of the Black Lives Matter movement, who are broader parts of the Democratic coalition, who are, as Glenn says, currently have this uh, very clear opposition figure in the White House, whether they're able, whether they stay active in the movement, whether that energy continues going forward, I think is an open question if Democrats are able to retake the White House. And I think this is especially a challenge um, considering that as um, so there's some great research by Professor Jacob Grumbach over at the University of Washington, who talks about how when it comes to uh, state governance in particular, uh, the Democratic and Republican parties are polarized on almost every issue area, but policing is not one of them. And so the considerable ideological overlap that still exists between the Democratic and Republican parties when it comes to policing may make that an additional challenge, even if Democrats uh, are victorious in the presidential election. I'm old enough to remember that when somebody invoked history and a historical thing, they were maybe talking about 1968, not something that feels like yesterday <laughs> to those of us dinosaurs in the room. But no, that's that's very, very true. And again, I think the the questions about policing have largely been oriented around questions of race and blackness in particular. Um, and I'm wondering, to go on because I think your points are, are are fantastic, but they do lead into this this other question of how do we grapple with or navigate or calibrate all of these quests for different types of social justice, especially within the context of this presidential campaign. I think that's a really critical question, Trevor, and I'm going to just um, preface by saying it's it's one that frustrates me the question because I think it presumes that. Uh, it's almost as it's almost a parallel to um, the move to all lives matter or blue lives matter, in that it presumes that that these are that these are separate issues, right? As if we can talk about disability justice, gender queer rights, migrant refugee rights without thinking about them 
as linked to race, racism and anti-black racism specifically. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine how um, in this moment we continue to, to separate, right? And, um, and I know that that's where the motivation for the question comes from. It strikes me that if we are to, to listen carefully to and to take seriously what um, race scholars are telling us, what um, anti-racist activists are telling us, what those who are um, doing to interrupt anti-Black racism specifically are telling us, is that the dehumanization and degradation of Blacks and African Americans is fundamental to dehumanization and degradation broadly, right? And so there is no possibility to move forward in, in any reasonable way on any justice movement without connection to solidarity with um, anti-racism. Um, and so my frustration, you know, comes from perhaps it's the dinosaur legacies of you know, being asked to choose this box or that box, this organization or that organization, this, this concern or that concern. Um, and really wondering, you know, and my frustration comes from, from the politics of higher education where, um, where, we, where we continually separate and question and ask, um, well, what about us and what about us and what about us as if the, the, the pieces are not connected. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, we know, we know that um, we have white structures or structures rooted in whiteness. We have institutions rooted in whiteness, but that doesn't mean that we have to have policies and practices that are also rooted in whiteness. It doesn't mean that we can't um, craft politics, practices, cultures that are about connection, solidarity, complexity. Um, I don't know often how we do that. I think that's, but I do know that, that the question does, does the emphasis on race on anti-racism, anti-black racism specifically mean that we're not putting attention elsewhere is kind of like a uh, social change that is about diversity only, that it's about which bodies are in the room. And that is clearly to me, just not a politic that works. I think that's right. I worry though that how do we as academics, as teachers and scholars confront that, what is ultimately a public communication challenge, right? How do we make those arguments for that overlap, that connectiveness that uh, I don't want to say because it's sort of become a cliche, but it's true, that intersectionality, right? Where all of those forces, the forces for, of social justice for disability uh, rights versus women's rights and all of that, how they're, I think in the public mind and in the public media, they're often pitted against one another. And how, what can we do? What's the role of public communication and communication scholar teachers and academics generally in, in combating that? Uh, how, do we, how do we do that? I think, um, I mean, maybe, you know, two, two things that come to mind are, um, are complementary. One, I think, is um, amplifying the, voice, the voices and the perspectives of, um, of activists activists and movements that are highlighting these connections now. And I actually think that's been a strength and, and an inspiration of a lot of the, the, so, the movements for social change this summer is that they've continued, they've continued to highlight this, like you say, this intersectional frame. I mean, even the conversations around, um, you know, the conversations around the, the, the lead up to the, the, um, the grand jury invest, uh, around Brianna T Taylor's mur murder, and then that that conversations afterwards, after the travesty of not, you know, of of the the, the grand jury decision, and and all those conversations, I think have have highlighted, have continued to highlight this connection and and, and comparison, right, between um, that unique position. So I guess one thing would be to highlight those those voices in our classes and our scholarship and our you know panels like this, and then. I think as, as you know, academics or scholars or teachers, we can also participate in helping um, in, the, in those contexts, deepen those conversations. Um, you know, for example, in our, in our classes and our students, when we're talking with our students, when we're talking about these issues, it can, be, it can be easy to kind of, like you say, Trevor, kind of slip into that, like we're gonna have a conversation this week about 
about Black, Black Lives Matter and race. And then next week we'll talk about feminism and, and Roe v. Wade and abortion and, and the Supreme Court. And then next week, whereas um, I think, and, and th that's an easy thing to slip into, but I think we, we need to work hard to in, always have these conversations at a multi, you know, layered level, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Not separating them out. And yeah. Assuming yeah. that they're discrete sorts of things. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think really just naming that, you know, it is the very same politic um, that the impetus that allows the nation to continue to sit by and watch the brutal racialized murder of blacks on the streets and to have nothing happen is it is the same it is that same ideology that same politic um, that uh, is behind um, aggressive politics of detention and deportation um, mm -hmm. around the assault on, on women's reproductive rights. There is the underlying piece um, is there. And if we can continue to articulate that and link it to dehumanization and degradation, then we start to make those connections for people. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. A dimension of all of this is the sort of larger uh, aspects of distrust amongst particularly underrepresented uh, folks and um, uh, folks who who are, um, you know, for a variety of reasons since 1619, automatically distrustful of uh, promises of change, of hopeful messages from the government, from elected officials. Uh, it affects their voting behaviors. It affects their participation in vaccine trials. I mean, it's it's uh, throughout the the um, the the whole conversations that we have about this. How do we deal with that? What do we do about that, that inherent and perfectly justifiable mistrust that is a function of the systemic racism that surrounds us all the time? Glenn, go ahead. Sure. I, well, I mean, I, I think one thing is to recognize the legitimacy of that response and, and its history uh, and that we don't, we don't end up functionally blaming um, communities of color for responding to the history of white abuse that we have suffered. Uh, I say we as a, as a black man in, in this conversation. Um, so, you know, I, I also wanna push on, I, I wanna bring up the notion that, uh, you know, controlling for class and education, black people do participate in the political process at even higher levels than whites. Absolutely. So it is, it is not that being that, a, you know, uh, that race means lack of participation. I think what we're talking about is the effects of uh, oppression causing lacks of participation. And so there's there's going to have to be some, uh, not accommodation made, but some healing done, frankly, uh, and some trust building done if we wanna see these things change in the way that, that the question uh, alludes to. Mm -hmm. And I think your point, Glenn, is really important. Um, it's not about, the problem doesn't lie with um, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian American, Pacific Islander communities. It lies with the systemic piece, right? Mm -hmm. as, as we think about it in terms of voting, it lies with voter suppression, voter intimidation, right? I'm sure you all saw um, the news in Texas yesterday uh, that counties are now going to be allowed one ballot drop off, right? A mm -hmm. clear move to suppress and to intimidate. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking about very large counties uh, where a lot of black and brown people live and vote, uh, as opposed to the rural Texas counties. I just wanted to, to add to what Lisa and Glenn were saying when we're thinking about, um, obviously, the actions of politicians, state governments, the national government are a big part of uh, obstru intentionally obstructing the ability of minority voters to participate. Uh, but I think we also, you know, coming out as a political scientist, looking at it from like this 10,000 foot perspective as well, there are a lot of fundamental institutions um, that happen to be very disadvantageous to minority voters in the country as well. If we think about um, our single member districts that we use for congressional races that tend to be very, very, uh, that do a poor job of representing urban voters where a lot of minority votes tend to be concentrated, the design of the United States Senate which is heavily malapportioned and significantly overrepresents white voters, as does the Electoral College. 
those are all things that I think, you know, if we're thinking about long-term long -term goals for what would increase, you know, make people feel more represented in the system and maybe um, alleviate questions of not only participation, but representation, uh, those kind of institutions, I think, have to be things that are up for consideration. Especially given their roots in, um, you know, whiteness <laughs> and the perpetuation of slavery and the accommodation of slave owners uh, during the founding and the whole drafting of things. Yeah, no, I think that's interesting. Um, that also feeds on a lot of these calls that the presidential candidates and senatorial candidates are being forced to answer about these sorts of structural changes. I'm not certain that those questions are often asked in relationship to the systemic racism that those structures represent. Do you think that? I mean, I don't, I don't hear that a lot. When somebody says, are you going to pack the Supreme Court? They don't tease that out and demonstrate its linkages to, say, systemic racism or, uh, you know, end the filibuster in the Senate or something along those lines. Well, I, think it's, I think it's very interesting to see, for instance, that uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein of California last week was asked about the filibuster, and she said, she dec she said in, in essence, that uh, she did not want to, um, uh, to change it, to modify it. And there was a lot of outrage on the left and among liberal circles about that statement, but interestingly, the history of the filibuster and how exactly it's been used uh, oh, historically in order to uh, suppress civil rights legislation, right? That was, that was the way that civil rights legislation died in the US Congress for decades. Um, that hasn't been part of the conversation, but I think it absolutely should be. Right, let's not forget the filibuster in chief for years was Strom Thurmond. I mean, you know, that was his stock in trade, right? And that and it actually, I think, relates to the previous question about how, how we can promote these Converse, conversations in a more more complex way, and I think one thing that that is important that you know in in the sort of horse race coverage of of electoral politics, you know, um, it focuses so much on 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 strategy um, to the detriment of talking about um, like structure and root root causes. So I mean, I think exactly what you all, what you were just talking about where the conversation is like are the is biden gonna is biden gonna want to get rid of the of the filibuster is he gonna pack the court right but it's the conversation never is always that at the level of like a political strategy left versus right blue versus red and so to the extent that you know movements for social change or or you know researchers can can push the conversation to those to those structural and those kind of root the radical meaning to the root level that would be that would be advantageous not only and and also can help like the in the previous question you were asking about how can we show how these issues are interconnected uh -huh. um you know so i think there was just a new there was a news um Tiangi amata taylor at princeton a couple of days ago published a an article in the new york times that was about you know um it has it had a provocative title, you know, how, how we should abolish the Supreme Court or something like that. But the, the thrust of the article was kind of the argument that you all are making about um, the undemocratic nature of the court and the way that it's upheld white supremacy and patriarchy through through these decisions, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think I'm not necessarily, again, I'm not talking about strategy. I'm talking about pushing the conversation to those root levels, I think is really important. And I think this is where social movements really enter the conversation because they are attempts to push the system to be responsive to people that it historically has not been responsive to. Mm -hmm. And that what we're coming up against now is that it's not just the system, that the people in the system have been unresponsive to these communities, but that the system itself is designed to not be responsive to those communities. And that there are a series of things that, uh, you know, Isaac laid out um, that, are easier, easier means of preventing the system from being responsive to historically black and brown communities than it is to be progressive or to create a, a more democratic system. Creating a democratic system seems to be harder than creating mm -hmm. a, an anti-democratic system. And that was by design of the founders. I think one thing that we need to do and, and one reason that the president I think is uh, so hostile to critical race theory is because it stops deifying the founders as as perfect. It stops deifying right. this uh, our system that is so unresponsive to 
uh, minority communities as perfect. And it starts saying, look, we have work that we need to do in our generation to create an actual democracy. You yeah, and I, I just wanted to jump in on that briefly, which is that if we want to, that I think all of these institutions are interconnected, obviously, with the pol policy outcomes that we see, which can be so disastrous for minority communities. Right. If we think about, for instance, the, the landmark Shelby, Shelby County v. Holder case that came out of the Supreme Court, which gutted parts of the Voting Rights Act, um, we can step back and think, why do we have a court that has a majority that can produce this, this kind of opinion? Well, obviously, they've been nominated by re those, those majority justices in the majority there are nominated by Republican presidents, confirmed by Republican senates. And then we think about how do these presidents and senates get elected? Well, I'm thinking about in the last 20 years, there's only been the, a Republican presidential candidate has only won the popular vote once. And repeatedly, we've seen the Senate, uh, Senate majorities being created with minority support of the national vote because of the unequal apportionment uh, of senators across states, or that they're equally apportioned regardless of population, rather, which is uh, what we call malapportionment in political science. Right. So that, those, whole, those processes compound on each other. And you know, we, all these political outcomes are deeply interwoven with the unequal institutions which we have. I've often laughed because rather than grapple with the structural biases and problems with the Senate, the answer from some is, well, let's just make Washington and Puerto Rico states, and then we'll just add four more senators, and that's going to somehow solve the problem and get at issues of racism as well, because you're talking about majority uh, African American and, and Latinx populations. I'm not certain that actually gets the job done. I don't know. I, I think it's important for democracy. I think we should sure. make them states, but I, <laughs> I don't do think that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think that it gets the job done because of the malapportionment issue that uh, Isaac is talking about. Yeah. And I think that one thing that we should, you know, in in terms of the communications and the conversations that we're having, there's a broad conversation happening that suggests, well, when whites are no longer the majority, then things will change. And what we see is already a system in which we have a tyranny of the minority, right. that even when whites are the plurality, I'll, I'll point out they will never be in our lifetimes the, the minority. They will, they will be a plurality um, if they become a minority, uh, if they lose majority status at all. Sure. But that plurality is more than capable of continuing to dominate as a, as, as a plurality or even as a minority, which we already see. So we need to make structural changes that lead toward democratization, small d democratization uh, in every way that we can. That kind of leads into my next question, which I think goes to the difficulties that folks on the left and in particular the Democratic Party and in the context of this um, campaign, the Biden campaign, uh, in advancing arguments or you know, planting their flag on those systemic structural changes. You know, we write off the the Republicans and we say, well, you know, they're kind of whiteness personified and and they sort of pursue that and, and, uh, and you know, do a wink and a nod towards Tim Scott, but that's about it, right? Um, the, how do, how do the Democrats overcome this? I mean, it seems to me that, you know, these kinds of structural changes are are difficult. Are they managing at all to move the ball down the field? Um, you know, what's your sense of how the Biden campaign, I guess, is dealing with these structural issues, but with race and, and all of that in general? Maybe the question, Trevor, is what, if any, interest in investment do they have in moving the ball? Um, and, and here's where the distrust comes. Um, mm -hmm. I have very little optimism to think that Biden is invested in undoing anti-racism. Or in undoing racism. I, have, I see little evidence around me that very many folks, even all those who, you know, are wanting the, to attend the sessions and are listening to the talks and are, when, when it comes down to making structural change, that's where everything stops. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's worth noting that, you know, as, as, a, as a candidate in the Democratic primary, uh, a lot of the appeal of, of Biden's pitch was that structural change, he was not going to be bringing structural change, right? He was going to be bringing continuity. And, you know, his own personal history with race is, I'd say, complicated to say the least, right? He was the co-author of the 1994 crime bill. 
gave eulogies for Strom Thurmond and Robert Byrd, pushed President Ronald Reagan to ramp up incarceration, and now infamously, thanks to a debate with his now vice presidential nominee, he opposed busing as well, right? And so all of those things kind of suggest that, you know, there's not, I, I don't think we should necessarily expect that, you know, if, if Biden weren't representing a larger coalition, that, uh, that he would necessarily be that interested in, in as, as, as Lisa says, moving the ball on that. There is kind of, whether voters perceive all of those previous things in his candidacy is a whole different question, right? As Obama's vice, uh, vice president and as, you know, the, the leader of the Democratic Party, which is increasingly associated with racial liberalism, it's very questionable whether voters are, you know, whether they're applying the Democratic Party brand or thinking about Biden's own personal history. Um, but I think given his own legislative track record, I agree completely with Lisa that we should be deeply skeptical that he's going to be really committed to changing those fundamental institutions once he, if he becomes president. But then what are we left with? I mean, arguably Obama didn't change any of those institutions. Um, you know, he didn't move the ball much down the field, I don't think, and certainly may have moved it backwards in terms of, you know, migrant rights and, <laughs> you know, uh, immigrant uh, questions. So what are we left with? I think we're left with, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. Go ahead. I think we're left with the, the point and the power of social movements, which is to drive the agenda to force our uh, political officials to move in, in particular directions. I mean, President Obama very famously, you know, called on the uh, the OFA to continue to push him uh, so that he could, you know, in, embrace particularly progressive policies. And we saw that after Ferguson and the the, the Black Lives Matter movement really manifesting, he then was able to use his, uh, off, the attorney general's office to oversee police and do some of the things that, that progressives are looking for. So if the movement continues and continues to push, you know, it, Biden, the, Biden's interests as a person are important. I don't want to say that, that human agency is not important. Human agency is important, but uh, finding using social movements as ways to push them to use their agency in particular ways is going to be important. And so we have to stay organized. I'm sorry, Lisa, to interrupt. No, I think I hear us as making a very similar argument. You know, I, I was trying to think this by looking at um, efforts uh, on my campus to, um, to, to interrupt. And I, it seems to me that the most progressive, and I think it's not at all progressive move that uh, we ever see coming from um, highest levels of positional power is the move to, di to diversify, right? To add more bodies. And if we're gonna wait, like on my campus, if we're gonna wait um, for social change to come from the chancellor, well, that's, you know, not, we, we just give up, right? The change comes when we say, all right, so what is it that we are able to do? Um, which I think, Glenn, is very much in line with what you're saying. Yes. Okay. So movements are going to, have they, has that ever worked before? Yes. I mean, the civil rights movement okay. was very effective in, in causing some structural changes. Uh, you okay. know, the, the fall of Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, a, a whole series of other things, the end of the immigration quotas from 1924. Um, you know, I mean, to the extent that women have more access to uh, the workplace and, and uh, uh, means of, of combating sexual harassment, things like that. Those came through movements that were both state-centered and uh, public-focused. So we there is reason to hope. Uh, I'm not often the, the hope uh, uh, preacher here, but uh, I do think that our history does give us some reason to hope uh, in social movements in that way. Yeah, and I, I also just wanted to, to, to add to that. I think that there's often a view of history that gets espoused that, you know, the civil rights movement was something that was kind of, that was occurring in the population. And then, you know, LBJ had a change of heart, you know, he decided, you know, he, re, you know, really, it really got to him. And then he, because of that, we have the civil rights movement, or civil rights act, the voting rights act, racial realignment, the process by which the parties kind of have, ide have sorted on the basis of racial attitudes. But a lot of more recent scholarship has pointed out that that's really a simplistic view of what happened in the civil rights era. And that really, if you're thinking about why LBJ was able to enact 
the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act with the support of a Democratic Party that had a lot of Southern segregationists in it? The answer is decades of movement building, decades of pressure within the party, a very concerted and strategic effort by civil rights activists to pressure the Democratic Party from within. And it was, it was not some you know, pivotal moment where the, the Democratic Party could have gone either way in the 1960s. It was more of the culmination of decades of activism and movement building and external pressure, which finally yielded that policy outcome. Hmm. I, I agree with, no, I agree with everything that the other, the other panel, I mean, that Glenn and Isaac and Lisa have, have said. And I, I, I wanted to say, I, I don't, I, sometimes I get nervous about the word hope because of, because of the kind of uh, ideological baggage it has now. Um, but but I do agree with the sentiment, and I, I was going to add another layer to it, which is, you know, a lot of times when we focus on on movements and the power that movements have, we focus on the you know movements being um, movements pushing for kind of political uh, change at the federal or state or what, or even local level. But 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 the other thing I think that's powerful about movements and the movements that we're seeing now is that you know movements um, are opportunities for building community, building, building the kinds of communities that, that, we want, that we want to see, for putting into, into practice the visions that we have, which, which you know, no, matter how, you know, no matter how hard they push, aren't usually done in the matter of one administration or the other. And so I think, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of all of the, all of the rise of mutual aid that communities that have arisen over the, the spring and summer in light of the coronavirus pandemic, where, where different communities, I mean, we've seen this here in, in, in Urbana-Champaign, where I live, com coming together to provide, for those, to provide for those in need, to pull resources and, and, um, and skills, to you know, help people who are isolated. And, and, those are the kinds of, and those kinds of communities are the kinds that are the things that movements can, can produce and that you know, at the that at the national political level, aren't aren't sort of mobilized in the same way, you know. Yeah, and as you're as all of you are talking about this hopeful uh, <laughs> sense of movements, I'm struck with the difficulties that we face when we talk about. Uh, I guess I'd call it a rhetoric of progress, right? This this idea, and you know, maybe it's uh, it's um, King's uh, arc of justice or arc of history bending towards justice and things like that. It strikes me that those rhetorics, both of hope and of progress and of justice, are so linear and almost um, relentlessly sort of progressive that they can't really account for a Trump, right? Or the the ten steps back that we take. Um, I'm I'm thinking here of the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and all that she represented for decades, and now we're looking at a six three majority to strike down uh, Roe versus Wade, uh, to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, to to you know potentially undermine gay gay and, and lesbian rights. Uh, or LGBTQ rights and all of that. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Am I just whistling Dixie here, or should we stick with the sort of movements will make the change the world kind of kind of idea? Uh, I think that you. I mean, you have a point, right? That mo it, it's definitely not a a linear process. I appreciate one of the points that Ibram Kendi makes and stand from the beginning is that it's not as though. Uh, progressive movements are the only ones that are moving. Uh, you know, regressive movements are advancing as well at the exact same time. Uh, and so there's a there's there's a, a a co relationship there that we have to attend to. That pushing in one direction, there also needs to be a rear guard because the opposition um, is is pushing as well. That's just a feature of of time and movement. It's nothing is inevitable. We all are working to advance our, our interests. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to briefly add to that, that it's exactly to Glenn's point, um, you know, there are large parts of the country where Roe is already de facto overturned, right? If you, sure. if you live in, in certain parts of the country, there is one abortion clinic that you have to drive a whole day to get to, 
right? And then you have to come back again the next day because of the pr procedures put in pa place by the state legislature, right? Um, so as, and this is the, the result of the success of the kind of regressive movements that, that Glenn talks about, and obviously it's a push and pull. And we can think about, you know, you know, when it comes to things like abortion, or when it comes to things like economic inequality, which has, you know, been increasing quite steadily over, over, over decades, right, without, without a, you know, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of progressive success on the income inequality front, for instance. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of forces moving in the opposite direction as well, and a lot of interests that are very powerfully aligned against, you know, the, the, the things that the movements for, for racial justice or economic justice or gender justice care about. And then it goes back to the public communication piece of this, right? The, the progressive narrative, the linear narrative um, is just a narrative of, of whiteness, white supremacy that allows us to relax, that um, says, well, things are so much better now. So it takes, you know, you can check out the conversation. And so we have to, I think we have to disrupt that narrative of progress um, in every way possible and really name kind of a, a, a racial temporality to it, um, a, a race, uh, what would it mean to articulate um, movement um, that is not linear uh -huh. uh, and, and or circular, any of those pieces, uh -huh. and as a way to think about how we challenge conversations around race. Uh -huh. Speaking of challenging conversations about race, I think the last couple of days have been particularly poignant prior to the president's diagnosis of coronavirus. We had his performance on Tuesday night uh, in the first presidential debate where he, um, you know, and I don't know if this is necessarily all that significant, but it seems symbolically significant at least, where he, you know, refuses to condemn uh, the Proud Boys. What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacist and right like me to condemn white Proud Boys. Proud Boys. And right Proud Proud Boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by. And, and ends up uh, then going to Duluth, Minnesota on Wednesday and, or Thursday, whenever it was, and um, really pulling out some, some significant white nationalist racist tropes uh, against Ilhan Omar, uh, the congresswoman from, from Minnesota. And what about Omar where she gets caught harvesting? What the hell is going on? I hope your U.S. attorney is involved. What? What is going on with Omar? I've been reading these reports for two years about how corrupt and crooked she is. Let's get with it. Let's get with it. I mean, frankly, harvesting's terrible, but it's the least of the things that she has done. How the hell? Then she tells us how to run our country. Can you believe it? Uh, any thoughts on how this might you know, play out and how we we deal with all of this as as uh, uh, you know, interested parties seeking to educate young minds and move the society towards greater social justice. It just it seems frustrating. So I'm curious about your reactions to these recent events. I think that Trump's remarks, while they're inflammatory, are also quite par for the course for his presidency and his 2016 campaign. Um, I think it recalls his post Charlottesville remarks where he said there are, you know, are very fine people on, on both sides, referring to the white supremacists who, who showed up as counter protesters in Charlottesville. Um, we can also, all, of course, all recall back in tw his 2016 campaign where he said that many Latino immigrants are criminals and rapists, right? Uh, and there are, there are a lot of examples in this vein. Uh, and there's a lot of political science research, including some work I've done with uh, Dr. Carlos Ogara at the University of Texas El Paso that shows that Trump and Republican candidates uh, down ballot have benefited from these kinds of racial appeals and racially conservative white voters are swayed by them, right? We've seen that there is a real electoral incentive for uh, Republican candidates, including President Trump, to engage in this kind of rhetoric. Um, and whether or not his remarks are off the cuff from the heart or purely strategic, I think he knows that that kind of rhetoric helped him win in 2016. And I think like many politicians, he wants to win reelection. Um, and so I think, I think it's, it's disappointing to hear that kind of rhetoric, but certainly not surprising. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder if the alternative is, you know, the rhetoric pre-2016, uh, which was still as um, 
still a rhetoric of whiteness, just one that was tempered in racial neutrality. And again, if we think about um, trying to do interruptions at local levels um, around policies, practices, culture, you know, it's so much easier to interrupt the overt and so much harder to interrupt the latent and the um, implicit because, you know, we have to work that much harder to convince um, again, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of like the higher ed landscape, but I think it's it's a pretty relevant metaphor for politics to convince um, those who can make the change that a particular policy is racist if we can't, if it's couched in racial neutral language. And so then, you know, the work that we're having to do in order to, to, to advance those changes um, is longer, slower, um, and way, way fewer allies. So uh, there's a real risk to a lot of bodies when he mobilizes white nationalists. Um, we know that, 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 that there's uh, violence on people's bodies um, and there's the, the violence is still there without the overt white nationalism. But you're saying that in a way, we're fortunate that he's so overt about it, that it changes at least the calculus that uh, we have to do in the pursuit of social justice. I don't want to say fortunate. Okay. You I, um, I want to say um, there are a lot more people listening mm -hmm. and ready to say, okay, let's think about this. Let mm -hmm. me think about what I'm doing. Let me think about this practice. Let me think about this policy. Um, and it's much harder to do that um, in racially neutral language. So mm -hmm. I, 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 the, the mobilization of um, white terrorism is terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, black bodies have been scared for a very long time with right. very good reason. Right. Hmm. I think that this takes us uh, back to one of the points we were making before, which is that, you know, progressive movements and regressive movements move at the same time. So some of the work that I've been doing, um, a lot of my work studies white evangelicals, especially as a, uh, as a social movement group, and some of the work I've been doing with the Barna Group and the Racial Justice and Unity Center, we did a survey in 2019, July of 2019, where we asked people, do you think America has a race problem? It went from the options were definitely somewhat and none. And then we asked the question again, uh, Barna did through the Race Today study. And uh, again, in July of 2020, we found that the number of people who, of practicing Christians rather, who said uh, that there is no, not a race problem at all, went from 11% in, in 2019 to 20 to 19% in 2020, which is almost a doubling. And keep in mind what happened in that interim. What happened in that interim was the George Floyd uh, and Breonna Taylor uh, uh, murders. So what we're seeing and, and what uh, Chad Brennan was able to, to demonstrate in an article in Relevant Magazine is that uh, for those Christians, for those white Christians who were watching Fox News, they were even more likely to deny that there was a racial uh, problem in the country. So where you're getting your information Right, the communication that you are that you are in, uh, ingesting or, or digesting rather um, is greatly influencing you know these outcomes, and so we're going to see both move together. The president is going to be effective in using these kinds of uh, outrageous statements to excite his base, and they're also going to have the effect of mobilizing some people on the progressive side at the exact same time we're going to see these move together. It's, it, we, we shouldn't read one as a failure uh, or as a success. So I guess in, in, a, in a sort of wrap up mode, in a way to sort of bring this all together, um, thinking what, four years, five years down the road, uh, what the, uh, depending upon what happens uh, in the next 32 days, um, what does, what does our racialized political life look like? Uh, what does our discourse feel like? What, what can we expect, um, you know, moving forward? I think, you know, I guess I want to say that some, that some of it depends on, on the election, but then a lot of it doesn't. I mean, I think, obviously, as we've been talking about, you know, the, uh, you know, the election matters and had and can shape the kinds of conversations that are happening 
um, on the other side of it. But at the same time, I, I and, and I think this, we referenced this earlier, right? That, um, that to some degree, some of these, you know, some of these conversations we, we will, will be had, you know, conversations around, around policing and, and conversations around gendered violence and conversations around, you know, issues of immigration and, and, you know, I think, I think will those conversations will, will hopefully still be happening at, at the, you know, at the grassroots level and, and the difference is that there'll be, you know, political opportunities or political openings that allow for those, you know, for those conversations to take hold and push um, policy in certain directions. Huh. So, yeah. Great. And I think I'll just briefly speak to the electoral side of it. since That's my wheelhouse and that's what a lot of my research and teaching is about. Um, but I think it's interesting we're thinking about the future four years down the line, right? Thinking about 2024, for instance, right? On, on the campaign trail, former Vice President Joe Biden has, like, has advanced the view that President Trump is, isn't the new normal. He said that his quote is that history will treat this administration's time as an aberration and that after Trump leaves office, quote, you'll see an epiphany occur among many of my Republican friends, right? And I think his assertion raises this important empirical question, right? Is, is Trumpism distinct from the GOP's winning electoral formula going forward, right? And, but I think I, I, some, some, some research by myself and others have shown that like, if you, even if you just look at the 2018 midterms without Trump atop the ticket, or if you look back to the Obama era where Trump wasn't present, we can see this immense centrality of race and racial attitudes in American elections. And so I think the view that's espoused by some, including, including the Democratic presidential nominee, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of it, right? And I think it's exacerbated as well by the shifting party coalitions, right? We've seen that white working class voters that were traditionally part of the Democratic Party base have swung hard towards the Republican Party uh, in the 2000s. And we've seen simultaneously that suburban highly educated uh, white Republicans, particularly women, have been moving into the Democratic coalition as well and being strongly targeted by, uh, by, Democratic, by Democratic candidates. And these white working class voters who were previously part of the Democratic New Deal coalition because of the liberal economic policies, many of which they continue to support, um, well, the, the success that the Republicans have had with them is, is in part, of course, driven by these racial appeals and the fact that the Democratic Party has been decreasingly making economic appeals to these voters. And so there's a really strong electoral incentive because of these shifting party coalitions for Republicans to try to continue to try to run up the score and eat into these formerly Democratic voters. Um, and I think that creates this really strong messaging and electoral incentive for them to continue to make these kind of racialized appeals, which were able to not only deliver them uh, victories in the 2016 presidential election, but also rack up congressional majorities in 2010 and 2014. And so I expect that with the current trend in the party coalitions, we'll continue to see uh, Republican candidates utilize nationalist rhetoric, make racial appeals, the, the electoral incentives are there. So a repudiation of Trump's not gonna make any difference if it happens. I mean, I think that you could, there's, there's a tension as I think was mentioned by Lisa earlier between the explicit appeals towards race that Trump has made versus the dog whistle appeals to race that typified earlier campaigns. We can even go back and think about the, uh, the, the Southern strategy pioneered by Lee Atwater, thinking about the Nixon campaign, the Reagan campaign, the H.W. Bush campaign, right? Um, I, all of those featured, of course, dog whistle, you know, more, much more subtle racial appeals. And I think if, they're, if Republicans get the message that these explicit appeals are electorally damaging, they may, we may see a return to those kind of dog whistle style appeals, but I certainly don't think that racialized messages uh, are, are, necessarily, uh, are necessarily going anywhere. And considering that the last, you know, that the last Republican presidential victory was in part assisted by these racial appeals, I think makes it likely that we're going to continue to see, at least from a good chunk of Republican candidates, explicit racial appeals going forward. I'm old enough to remember the lily whiteism of Herbert Hoover, but we'll put that aside. Go ahead, Glenn. What do you think? Oh, wow. Well, I, you know, I picking up on what the other panelists have said, racism is the, the dividing line of our country and it's going to continue to have extraordinarily, 
extraordinary legs, I would say on, on, on both sides, that this movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, has demonstrated some continuity. Mm-hmm. These, um, these small local uh, uh, communities that have, have formed as among activists, they, are, they will be able to, to survive changes in the news cycle, things like that. Events will continue to happen. Uh, whites, especially white police, will continue to kill black people, unfortunately, and other people of color and trans people, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it will, that will continue to demonstrate the need for the movement. So the movement is going to continue. The movement will still be here. Uh, in 2024, 2025, and white supremacy and the the dog whistles, the explicit calls, et cetera, that uh, Isaac was talking about will also be here, uh, I think, as loud, if not louder, in, uh, in 2024, if only because the sense of white um, aggrievement or the sense of loss, especially, frankly, among uh, white Christians, is going to only amplify as their numbers uh, appear to be in decline. Exactly. So expect more of the same in in even louder. Well, you guys are giving me a lot of hope here. This grievance politics is going to stick with us for a long time. Lisa? I guess the piece that I'd add is, um, you know, that we're going to see the financial uh, devastation um, for a long time, and that devastation is going to be global, and that means that um, migrant refugee communities are going to be uh, continue to um, face the the probably the the biggest hit to to their lives, and that then means that um, nations cast within whiteness are going to continue to uh, fear. The, that kind of assault on the nation, that perceived assault on the nation, I should, I should make clear to say it that way, which then is going to just intersect with, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what Glenn names the, the constant that the black men are still going to be killed by white police, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and when you put those together, the, and I don't think that this is just a Republican narrative, this is a narrative of, of a nation in whiteness. Um, that the threat and the fear is, is out there and the response to threat and fear is to protect um, that much more vehemently. So, you know, we have to have, we have, to have something to hold on to and we know that um, a Biden presidency is going to do less damage than the Trump presidency. Um, and, and we know that, um, you know, the local elections, um, the midterms are also bringing about incredible change. And so that piece um, is, is significant is very significant all right well on that hopeful incremental note i want to thank you all very much i think this was a stimulating discussion and a very interesting uh entree point for communication matters the nca podcast and our public program series to really dig into some of the issues surrounding race and social change and social protest has its occurring or not occurring in the context of the 2020 presidential election. So listeners, I hope you enjoyed this discussion and I hope you'll uh, join us for the third public program in this special series that will be coming out and dropping in your podcast uh, list in a couple of weeks. For more information about NCA's public programs and uh, the Communication Matters podcast series, visit the uh, NCA website and natcom.org slash public programs to look at our series of public programs. And uh, the podcast page, Communication Matters, the NCA podcast, will have a complete listing of every episode that we've done. So thank you, Lisa, Glenn, David, and Isaac for joining me today. And listeners, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Communication Matters, the NCA podcast. (music) 